Greenhouse homes are not a new invention. In fact, humanity has been trying to bring the garden indoors for centuries. This concept moved from the fringe into the mainstream conversation. It's no longer just about growing food, it's about redefining our relationship with the climate. It's about creating a microclimate that wraps around your life, offering a sheltered existence that blurs the line between inside and outside. I'm Tim Ung. Over the past year, I set out on a design challenge to develop over 35 unique greenhouse home concepts. Each one was a distinct response to a specific climate, a specific family need, or a specific architectural question. Through hundreds of hours of modeling, researching, and reading your incredible feedback in the comments, the philosophy behind these homes has evolved. Today, I want to share the five lessons I've learned about what it really takes to design a home that lives inside a garden. The first lesson is about passive performance. We often assume a greenhouse home needs massive, complex machinery to function, but the most powerful benefit is actually passive. It extends the planting season by simply existing. By building a greenhouse shell around a traditional home, we create a thermal buffer zone. Think of this like wearing a windbreaker jacket on a freezing, blustery day. The jacket stops the cold wind from hitting your skin directly, but more importantly, it traps a small layer of air between the fabric and your body. That air gap is significantly warmer than the outside world. In architecture, this buffer zone means the inner home is never exposed to the harshest extremes of winter. Because this secondary shell takes the brunt of the weather, we can actually reduce the amount of heavy insulation needed on the inner structure. We create a semi-outdoor living space that essentially steals weeks from the winter, allowing you to start your garden in February instead of May and keep harvesting well into December. It drastically lowers the heating and cooling loads for the main residence because the house isn't fighting the weather, it's just negotiating with the greenhouse. However, if your goal is true year-round production, like growing tropicals in Canada or tomatoes in January, passive solar isn't enough. We need to actively create a microclimate. This brings me to the second lesson, the synergy between greenhouse homes and the geothermal systems. The most sustainable way to climate control these large volumes of air is to use the earth itself as a battery. At a certain depth, usually about 6 to 10 feet down, the ground maintains a constant temperature of around 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit, regardless of whether there is a blizzard or heat wave above. By installing a ground source heat pump, we can push air through ductwork that's buried in the yard. In the winter, the earth warms the air before it enters the greenhouse. In the summer, the cooler air absorbs the heat, naturally air conditioning the garden. This is infinitely more efficient than trying to heat a glass box with a gas furnace. By coupling the home's mechanical system with the greenhouse, we can maintain precise humidity and temperature levels, ensuring that both the humans in the living room and the fruit trees in the greenhouse are comfortable year-round. The third lesson is perhaps the most technical. Not all transparent materials are created equal. The skin of your greenhouse dictates its longevity, its efficiency, and its safety. For many DIY enthusiasts, polycarbonate is the entry point. It's cost-effective, shatterproof, and diffuses light beautifully for plants, but it scratches easily and can degrade over time. For a permanent residence, the gold standard is a hybrid system. Laminated tempered glass for the roof and insulated glass units for the walls. Laminated glass is crucial overhead because if it breaks, the plastic interlayer holds the shards in place, protecting the people below. It's also extremely impact resistant, offers superior UV protection, and insulation values that polycarbonate just can't match. But with all this glass comes a major responsibility, bird safety. This is a huge topic in the comments. We can't build sanctuaries for nature that end up harming it. The industry's solution is fritting, a ceramic pattern baked into the glass. To a bird, this grid of dots looks like a solid barrier that they need to avoid. To us, it effectively disappears from a distance. 
We can take this a step further with building integrated photovoltaics. Imagine a glass roof where the frit pattern is actually tiny solar cells. You get transparency for the plants, collision safety for the birds, and electricity for the home, all in a single material. This is an example of a glass roof with building integrated photovoltaics that I saw in the Vatican Museums in Rome. Lesson 4 is about closing the loop. In a standard home, we treat water as a linear source. It comes in from the city, we use it, and we flush it away. In a greenhouse home, water should be circular. The massive roof area is a perfect rainwater catchment system. But we can go deeper. There are systems now that treat residential wastewater on site, separating it into clean water and nutrient-rich compost. I know, the idea of using your own waste in the garden sounds unappealing to some. But essentially, this is just a miniaturized version of what happens at a municipal scale, just without the energy-intensive transport. A greenhouse home offers the unique opportunity to process this waste into food for your plants, turning the home into a living ecosystem. The final and perhaps most important lesson is that there is no one-size-fits-all design. They need to be designed for their specific region. For example, designing a greenhouse home in a warm and dry environment like the southern regions of California will need to address overheating from the sun and droughts due to lack of rain. Instead of having a full glass roof over the greenhouse, what if we reduce the glass area to only the sizes and areas that we need to grow the types of plants that we want in the garden? What if we could design a method to conserve rainwater, store it, and recycle water from a dehumidification system? On the other hand, designing a greenhouse home in a northern region like Alaska might not be the most economically feasible or efficient idea because there's less sunlight throughout the year. This means that the greenhouse will lose most of the heat it gains from the sun and it'll require more heating to keep the greenhouse at a constant temperature. But this is also a design opportunity to create something unique like a movable insulated panel that can shut out all the glass when the sun begins to set. It's like covering an outdoor hot tub with an insulated cover to keep in the warmth and reduce the cost of heating the water. Through researching real-world examples like the Nature House in Sweden and iterating through my own 35 concepts, I realized that this architectural movement is about more than just aesthetics. It's about designing homes that give back to the environment and to the health of the people living inside of them. All of these examples that I've been researching and learning about, as well as my own concept designs, are working towards a common goal, designing a home that gives back to the environment and the people living in it. It's leading to more questions about what residential architecture could be and how the buildings we design can facilitate a better and healthier way of living. For me, it's led to a new thought about designing architecture for humanity, places that provide healthy food for its residents, builds a multi-generational community, and gives back to the world at large. Thanks for joining me on this journey. I'll see you in the next design.